Greetings, intrepid biologists. This is Dr. Jared Rathel, and I welcome you to Islands, Planet Earth's Evolutionary Laboratories. Islands are super cool because they represent little microcosms of evolution, independent replicates where we get to see evolutionary processes play out again and again. So by now you're well aware that islands were critical uh, for Charles Darwin um, as he thought about Galapagos, mockingbirds, tortoises, and eventually finches in formulating his ideas once he was back in the UK. I quote Darwin to start things out, nothing can be more improving to a young naturalist than a journey in a distant country. Although I can't physically take you to distant countries, um, I'd like to take you on a quick virtual tour. So let's start with some evolutionary oddities. So we'll start close to home off the Southern California coast on Santa Catalina Island. Here we find a species of rattlesnake. And if you look closely there at the yellow circle, it is a rattleless rattlesnake. So this is an adult specimen, um, but after all, when you use your rattle to alert large mammals about your presence, that adaptation doesn't do you much good on an island that lacks large mammals. This is the island nation of New Zealand off the southeastern coast of Australia. And here we find one of my personal faves. It is a flightless, nocturnal, ground-dwelling parrot. It's a parrot. These guys are extremely rotund. This flightless parrot can weigh up to nine pounds. And unfortunately, there's only an estimated 149 cockapos as of April 2018. That's left on planet Earth. Moving over to the island of Mauritius, off the coast of Madagascar, eastern Africa, the coconut crab, another heavyweight on islands. This is a, a relative of the hermit crab, the little guys that crawl in and out of shells. It is the largest living arthropod on planet Earth, um, coincidentally also weighing in at nine pounds. This, uh, these coconut crabs probably hit the maximum uh, threshold that an exoskeleton can support. There's a coconut crab checking out what the neighbors had for dinner. And then moving over to the island of New Guinea, specifically on the Huon Peninsula, we find living in the high altitudes these tree kangaroos. This species is the Machitsis tree kangaroo. So essentially, in the absence of placental competitors, kangaroos evolved into the canopy-dwelling large herbivorous mammal niche. So we'll conclude back on the island of New Zealand, the land of the kakapo. And I'd like to introduce you to the bird catcher tree of the genus Pisonia. You'll notice its long uh, seeds here that are extremely sticky and very good at adhering to birds. Now, using animals to disperse your seeds is a great tactic and it's not terribly uncommon, but what separates Pisonia lives on an island with relatively depauperate, diminished soils. So when birds become fledglings, become heavily laden with these seeds, they can't fly. So they end up dying right around the tree, providing a very rich source of nitrogen. So I want you to recognize that the islands that we're talking about today are volcanic in origin, meaning these islands were never connected to the continents, to the mainland. So these islands emerge over hot spots. The classic example, of course, is Hawaii, the 50th state, 
So the land masses are there in green. There's the big island of Hawaii. There's Maui. But if you look off to the northwest, you'll see the remnants of old Hawaiian islands. What's happening? There's a hot spot. It's Volcano uh, National Park, Kilauea, which has been quite active. And the continental crust is moving over that hot spot, creating new islands as it moves. Those islands erode into the sea. So here's Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, highest place on planet Earth, beautiful observatory, very cold, very high. So that's a new island, right, that's still being formed. And here's a middle-aged island, right? And you can see that now we've got this ring of land, and we have this lagoon, this shallow lagoon, as the island erodes into the sea. Eventually, you'll, you're left with these, these atolls. Um, these are sunken volcanoes, essentially. And it was actually Charles Darwin, we probably would have guessed it, that started to put this together. So you've got new land that's being formed, new terra firma. The question then arises, how do organisms get to these islands? How does Pisonia, the, the flightless parrot, the kakapo, how does it get to New Zealand? Turns out it was actually their ancestors long ago that colonized the islands. Organisms colonize islands, and I want you to remember this alliteration. It's stuck with me for about 20 years now. Colonizers colonize oceanic islands by wind, wave, and wing. So if you check out this little spider right here, it's uh, sending up a silk sail so that it can balloon up into the air currents. So our arthropods, insects, arachnids are wonderful at dispersing hundreds of miles using air currents, and there's so many of them, it doesn't take long before new islands are colonized. Probably the, the ultimate surfer is the coconut, which is ideally suited for dispersal via wave. So it resists desiccation and drying out, and when it washes up on far-flung beaches, it can germinate and start uh, new populations of coconut. And then finally, wing. So obviously birds and bats, flying organisms, have an advantage in terms of colonizing oceanic islands. So this is the ubiquitous rock dove or pig. When pigeons, or any organism for that matter, colonizes an island, once establishing itself, it's going to be exposed to radically different selection pressures. So pigeons evolved into the massive flightless dodo bird. Again, there's no reason to waste energy flying if there's no mammalian predators to avoid. So when hungry hominids, these sailors, arrived, the dodo bird, which likely had no fear of predation, uh, was quickly extirpated. This is the Nicobar pigeon, which is the genetically most uh, closely related extant species to the extinct dodo bird, a beautiful showy pigeon. So colonizers arrive on the island and they evolve into new species by a principle by which Darwin called natural selection. That is to say, when a slight variation on an individual's trait bestows it with a higher probability of surviving, reproducing, then those traits are going to become more frequent in the population over time. And what exactly causes speciation? You remember, it's all about reproductive isolation. So it can be geographic, like an island emerging from the sea, or it can be mechanical, behavioral. Okay, so 
great examples of colonizing species that have radiated into a myriad of different forms. The grass quit was the presumed South American ancestors to the famous uh, Darwinian finches. And you can see that these finches have occupied different niches. Remember, a niche is an organism's place in the ecosystem. So we've got a vegetarian finch. We have a mangrove finch. We have an insectivorous warbler finch. But they're partitioning the resources, specializing on different niches that are available on these islands. So the uh, Hawaiian honey creepers <laughs> far outnumber the Galapagos finches. There have been some 55 species of honey creepers on Hawaii that evolved probably from a single rose finch ancestor. So you even have hummingbird-like fin uh, rose finches, the EEV here. And then let us not forget about the amazing adaptive radiation that occurred in lemurs on the island of Madagascar. So I'd like to finish our journey at a cave, a massive limestone cave named Liang Bua on the island of Flores in the country of Indonesia. In 2003, archaeologists uh, unveiled uh, some pretty amazing finds from this cave that suggests that hominids, upright apes, of which you and I are one of many species of hominids that have existed in the past, uh, hominids also are subject to different selection pressures on islands. So here's Flores in Indonesia. Here are the fossil remains and this, so this is an adult skeleton. It's uh, fully fused and uh, skull. And there's the, um, what was recovered, I believe it was LB1. This is the holotype for um, the genus is Homo, and the species is Floresensis. But what's remarkable about this organism, this hominid, is its stature. So, these uh, diminutive little hominids stood approximately three feet tall. The fossils were aptly named the Hobbit um, after J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. But here you can see uh, Homo florensis uh, in comparison to an anatomically modern human and a Neanderthal. So, where did Homo florensis come from? Well, uh, it's got some pr primitive characteristics, sloping jaw, um, the heavy brow, let's see, shrugged shoulders, um, uh, pelvis, much like the Australopithecus. The Australopithecines preceded uh, the genus Homo. Most uh, scientists, paleontologists, believe that it likely evolved from Homo erectus, which again, is, it's in our genus, uh, but these uh, hominids left Africa long before humans did, some two million years ago. Uh, they were using fire, using tools. This is a map of human hominid fossil sites red being Homo sapiens, orange uh, Neanderthals, and what we're interested in here is Homo erectus, this light blue. Uh, these are all sites where Homo erectus specimens have been recovered, and you can see that there's a wealth of sites down here in Indonesia, which suggests that they would have been there uh, perhaps when sea levels rose and uh, Flores became an island, or perhaps rafting. So here's an artist's rendition of Homo florensis, the hobbit. So why would you be so small on an island? 
Well, islands are small land masses, at least compared to continents, and so resources are limited. So it makes sense to be a little bit more stingy with your energetic budget. So consider elephants. Elephants are uh, long distance dispersers capable of swimming in the oceans. On the island of Flores, uh, in the same cave that the hobbit was discovered, we found remains of a pygmy elephant, which evolved most likely from the Asian elephant. So some animals get smaller. Other animals, like the rat, got quite a bit bigger. This is the giant Flores rat. So this little hobbit, these little hominids, were likely hunting pygmy elephants and giant rats. So life was good, right? Uh, here we are on an island, island of Flores, limited resources. So um, what did they have to worry about? <laughs> Uh, there was also a very large dragon, uh, the Komodo dragon, which was present on the island of Flores. There were actually two species of large monitors, and here's a rendition of uh, two hobbits uh, doing battle with a Komodo dragon. So it certainly was an eat or be eaten world. And then we'll finish with this great slide, The Fellowship of the Hobbit. Here you can see the outline of the pygmy elephant, the two species of monitors, the giant rat, the hobbit. There was also, uh, I don't remember, 10, 12 foot tall uh, carnivorous stork, which was probably uh, pretty hard on hobbits as well. So, um, I'll conclude with that Rathel big idea that when we study nature, we'll find that um, it can be even wilder than our fictions. As John Lennon said, there is nothing new under the sun. So hobbits existed long before Homo sapiens dreamed them up. Thanks for listening. Cheers.